thanks for checking out Chemistry Connections on the Hopewell Valley Student Podcasting Network, a proud partner of HVSPN.com, where students come together to publish content to share with the world. The opinions represented within this episode are those of the content creators only. Please enjoy the show. Welcome to Chemistry Connections. My name is Gia Pundit. And my name is Olivia Kim. And we are your hosts for episode 12 called The Chemistry of Art Restoration and Conservation. Today, we will be discussing how many art pieces have been fixed and preserved through the application of chemistry concepts. When you enter an art museum, you may forget the many art efforts of artists, conservators, and even scientists behind the impressive masterpieces. Just as the paintings are something to marvel at, the meticulous process behind restoring and preserving artworks is just as fascinating. While the process of fixing art may appear of, to just consist of applying new layers, laboratory methods, some of which we have learned or explored about in AP Chemistry, are employed to ensure the best materials and techniques are being used to repair the artwork. Although the techniques to use to restore and conserve art can be very similar, there is a key difference between art restoration and conservation. Art restoration refers to the process of fixing an object so that it returns to its original condition or appearance, while art conservation refers to the process of preserving an artwork with the intent of preventing any further deterioration or discoloration. Yeah, so art conservation was first introduced during World War II due to the findings of undamaged works from Michelangelo and Vermeer. This was one of the first leading causes for conservation practices after the war. A famous example of art restoration is of the Sistine Chapel frescoes throughout the 1980s and 1990s. However, of course, not all art restorations or art conservation efforts are successful, which is where chemistry and other scientists have had a greater presence in the field of art. So now that we've discussed the historical aspect of art restoration and conservation, let's delve deeper into how it's all connected to chemistry. I will be covering art restoration, and later, Gia will take over with art conservation. The first part of fixing and maintaining art is the process of art restoration. Certain art restoration processes involve methods we learned about this year, but it really depends on the material used to create the art, and you're going to hear me say that a lot because obviously not every piece of art is made the same. Every artist chooses to employ um, different techniques and mediums to create the artwork and that kind of translates into what scientific method is used to create the artwork. No scientific method will be the same for each piece of art, but there are certain patterns in um, different restoration cases that I'll talk about later in terms of a two-step analytical process. So the crucial part of art restoration is making sure that the methods employed to fix the respective art piece are with the techniques and mediums used by the original artists. Especially in very old artworks where materials are not commonly used or easy to access today, applying scientific methods to art is necessary. So to better understand this process, I will be talking about a specific art restoration case. In the restoration of the Plague in Lucca, a painting done by Italian artist Lorenzo Viani, such methods were used. For some more context, Viani's painting had undergone a restoration process post-World War II, however that was not very effective and recently the artwork has undergone another restoration, this time with a more scientific approach and it ended up being a lot more successful. The restoration of Viani's painting, as with many art, other artworks, was a two-step process. The first part of the process, which relies heavily on non-invasive techniques, allows scientists and artists to look at the details of the painting such as the different paint layers and the original colors of the artwork. Images of the painting were taken at different wavelengths, which relates to concepts of electromagnetic radiation we briefly covered this year in AP Chemistry. Since each element produces a different atomic spectrum and emits unique light when electrons transition between energy levels, the multiband imaging technique helped scientists determine what elements are found in the pigments of the painting. For example, in Viani's artwork, Samples of lead, zinc, mercury, chromium, barium, and iron were detected in the pigments. This technique also helps scientists identify the exact colors used by Viani, which is really helpful to art conservators. Um, in combination with the emission spectrum, X-ray fluorescence, or XRF, analysis is also used to determine what elements make up certain pigments in the painting. 
XRF can identify the chemical makeup of the pigments by measuring the fluorescent X-ray emitted by a sample when the sample becomes exposed to an X-ray source. Since each element produces a unique fluorescent X-ray, similar to multiband imaging, data from XRF can provide specific information about the pigments. So for instance, in this specific restoration case, data from XRF indicated that a mixture of vermilion, also um, known as mercury-2 sulfide, and chrome green, um, which is chromium-3 oxide, uh, those pigments could have been used by Viani. So now moving on to the second part of the process, um, that second part of the process involves more destructive methods, including a combination of mass spectrometry, Raman analysis, and gas chromatography. Destructive methods give more insight about the exact nature of the chemical, since non-invasive techniques can only reveal so much. So in destructive methods, very small samples of the artwork underwent the process of mass spectrometry and gas chromatography, and the results of these two methods provide valuable information about what oils were used to bind the pigments. Mass spectrometry is a process of injecting atoms from the sample into the mass spectrometer instrument, which produces a mass spectrum. The mass spectrometer uses deflection to determine an object's mass, and this can be used to identify the specific elements in the sample. Knowing the chemical makeup of the oils that hold the pigments together is crucial to the art restoration process, because art restorers want to fix the painting using mediums that are very similar, if not identical, to the materials used when the artwork was first created. Even though I've focused on the chemistry of one specific art restoration case, the techniques used to restore Viani's painting are fairly consistent with other cases. As I've said before, the laboratory techniques are very dependent on the age and materials of the artwork, but there is a general two-step analytical process when deciding the best way to mend the painting. The second part of preserving art is art conservation, which is the process of preserving art pieces, whether it be architecture or even statues from future damages. A big part of conserving art requires a lot of in-depth research and analysis of either a painting or a sculpture to receive accurate data regarding what procedures should be used to fix the art piece so that there isn't much damage in the future. This is where the AP chemistry topics, mass spectrometry, and gas chromatography, known as GCMS, come into play. These specific techniques allow biologists to identify the compounds within the art piece by taking a tiny piece of the art and placing it into a GCMS machine. This can then help pinpoint what treatment should be used to conserve the art. The GCMS machine can also determine the reasoning behind discoloration or cracks on a piece. For example, there was a mission for conserving Buddha statues of Bamiyan, which represent Buddhist art. During the war in Afghanistan in 2001, the statues began to get popular and well-known, causing the Taliban to destroy the statues. Though, throughout the following years, organizations began to conserve the destroyed statues using techniques such as gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, leading to the findings of organic paint binders and a deeper understanding of cultures in Asia. Through AP chemistry topics such as extractions, desalting, and hydrolysis, substance such as egg proteins in this specific conservation from the samples can be determined via the GCMS. So what's the science behind this? Well, the full procedure of GCMS occurs in multiple steps, specifically two. The first step, like in art restoration, is analyzing the art. One way th that this can be done is through nano indentation microscopy, allowing scientists to analyze small parts of a piece to figure out if there's degradation or oxidation by applying a, a force onto a small piece of the art. Once analyzing has finished, the second step begins, the gas chromatography mass spectrometry section. Gas chromatography is the process of separating substances in a compound through the use of injecting the sample into a mobile phase with the help of an inert gas, the phase picks up substances to get tested. The other phase is the stationary phase, which is when the mobile phase passes through the column. The data gathered from the chromatography is then transferred to a chromatogram, which is a graph that shows the different components in the sample, each represented by a peak. Adsorption, a, a AP chemistry concept, also occurs during gas chromatography. Adsorption occurs during the stationary phase in the column causing the substances to separate. This leads to then the mass spectrometry section where the spectrometry analyzes each gas, specifically the masses of each of the substances by deflection, like Olivia said. 
thus helping determine the actual substances in the art piece by comparing the mass to other known masses. Along with what I said previously, although GCMS can be very helpful in determining materials in the art piece, a particular aspect that scientists are still trying to figure out when trying to conserve art pieces is whether or not the treatment going to be used is safe, that it won't cause future damages, or that they won't lose the original piece. However, removing surface dirt, varnishing, retouching areas, and fixing dents, a little small things, can have a big impact on small pieces that need conserving. So you may be wondering why we chose this specific topic. Um, the reason I chose the topic of art conservation and restoration is because I really enjoy making art in my free time and I'm interested in potentially starting studying art history in college. Whatever I end up doing, I want to keep art a part of my life, so learning about how STEM-related subjects like chemistry are directly related to artistic fields is really fascinating. So the reason I chose art conservation restoration as the topic is because I also have an interest in art. And although I'm not like a great artist, it's entertaining and fun to do on the side. But I don't particularly want to do anything in the future related to art. But I do know that I want to keep art in any way in my life, whether it be drawing or painting. And incorporating chemistry into art, two things that I enjoy, are really interesting to learn about and to see how chemistry is in even the smallest of things. Thank you for listening to this episode of Chemistry Connections. For more student-ran podcasts and digital content, make sure you visit www.hvspn.com. See you next time.